Hi everybody, Aaron Haynes, Haynes' World of Math. We're talking building thinking classrooms and obviously welcome back. Um, I know earlier in one of the videos I said I was gonna try to get some stuff for the, my classrooms up and between trying to figure out which lessons would be advantageous to record um, and making sure my students were comfortable with working with each other before I started recording and some conversations that I've had both with people in person and online, um, one theme kept on coming back. And so I thought I would go through and address this. Um, you know, some people talk about building thinking classrooms being a fad. Some people talk about there's some research out now saying it may not be the best thing. Um, and it kept on coming back to the fact that as we were looking through, or as I was looking through our unit one, I've got two new teachers to the team on my uh, Algebra 2 team. Um, we have a lot of really good activities. And I, remember, I went back to, a, uh, I was thinking back to a, presentation I saw at ASCD years ago in Orlando and from John Silver and who's it? John Brudstein. Okay, and they're big on learning styles. And I saw another study come through recently. I'll see if I can find the link. I think I saved it on X. Um, talking about how learning in your own learning style is important, but if you learn in a bunch of different learning styles, you actually get a much bigger um, bump. And I think they said it was like one standard deviation on the ACT, if I remember the presentation correctly, which is like three or four points on the ACT, which is obviously significant. So as I was looking through and I was going through about, okay, we have one or two building thinking classroom things here for unit one, I was like, and I know some of you feel this from the discussions we've had, is that at the end of the day, building thinking classrooms is just one tool in your tool chest. I remember when we went one to one, um, in terms of Chromebooks here at the high school. And the big push was we had to use the Chromebooks in some capacity almost every day. And I was reading studies about how hand notes helped it wire into your brain so much better. And some of it was like, well, we bought these, you need to use them. And the problem was is that you know, Chromebooks are not always the best tool for the job. Today we're doing transformations. It's a great tool for the job to use Desmos for that, which is why I'm not recording a building thing in classrooms and transformations for you. Okay, so, you know, it's one tool. Group work, I have a great group work activity that we did in Unit 1. I'll post it, I'll probably even try to do a video on it I'm about piecewise functions. Um, projects, um, I'm a big believer in the experience first, formalize later. I've got videos on that for my stats class. That's what I do for most of my AP stats class. Why? Because kids working together and getting up and moving around helps with the learning, which is why building thinking classrooms oftentimes is helpful. Kids are up, they're discussing math, and they're, you know, doing it in a somewhat informal way. And that, I think, is probably the bigger takeaway on this. So, if you're feeling pressured to have to do building thinking classrooms a lot, that's something that is probably being done so you can get comfortable with that tool. But I would suggest that you're probably going to dial it back. I would also suggest that you probably, if you have some really good effective lessons, that are engaging where it's just not you lecturing the class, that that probably would be worth fighting for if somebody's telling you that you need to change that into a building thinking classrooms lesson. Um, and again, like before, feel free to send your division chair or department chair to me and I'll be more than happy to talk about that. But again, I just got, I guess I wanted to name something that things are doing. Does that mean I'm going to stop doing building thinking classrooms videos? No, I think there's a, I think there's a lot of import to it. As I said, I find it fits my teaching style, which is fairly informal really well. I probably just hit my microphone there and it's really loud, isn't it? Um, I also think that it helps with classroom management to some extent if you do it right. But again, you also need to be true to yourself. Okay, so as long as you're hitting a bunch of different ways of doing things and you're not just doing thing, one thing all the time, I think there's going to be important to that. There's also some studies that say that every time you change something, the kids get more engaged. That's why changing seats is important because they're going to be working with other people. That's why sometimes reorienting your room is important. That's why doing different activities is important. And that's also why sometimes doing things by yourself is important. Again, I just wanted to name what I think a lot of people are saying feeling. Um, I also wanted to get some content out there because I know I had promised to get something out there and my lessons just weren't fitting there and this is why because I've got a lot of other good lessons out there and I can share those if you're interested. Um, 
And most importantly, um, I need to go do some grading of AP stuff because three classes has given me a pile of things to do. And I'm sure you have things too, so a little shorter than normal. I hope you find it helpful, and I will talk to you soon.